So this video is one hour, one minute, and ten seconds long. Good God, this is going to be a trip. Yep. So we did the Disney afternoon one a while ago. That was a lot of fun because it was good to relive some of our childhood and all that. And I. This is assuredly my childhood, though. Yeah, Fox for a lot of kids out there, I think, is a lot more, a lot more equatable. Okay, to... so do you remember Brooke? Brooke, the hosts for Fox Kids. I do remember her. Um, so she came to a Brooke and Andrew. I remember Brooke and Andrew early on, and then Andrew left, and then it was just Brooke. Yeah, like when I was a little kid, I thought Brooke was really cute. Oh, but, I did too. Uh, she I... came to a local like festival thing that I got to go to. I can't remember exactly what it was. But they had a contest to get a Fox Kids t-shirt. And the contest was, at the time, because it was popular at that time, getting really popular, to do the Macarena the best. Yeah. So I knew how to do the Macarena, and so I had entered the contest and was doing the Macarena. So Brooke came out to judge everyone, like, on, you know, how who was doing the best job, you know. And everybody else saw Brooke and stopped. I was an ADD little fucking kid, so I was just... I'm out of my own business, still doing the Macarena. So she came up and chose me, and I won. What? Yeah. Awesome. Because basically, I was the only one still doing the Macarena. So, dude, did, did did anyone take a picture of that? Or um, my mom probably has something somewhere. Oh man, I'll have to see if I can find it. Because I remember Brooke. Uh, I remember when uh, she was doing promoting. Uh, when she was promoting the whole thing with uh with, they were doing like uh the the when they were promoting the fairs and when they were pr- promoting like. The Appalachian Fun Alley and all that. Yeah, I think one of those is probably what I went to. Yeah, and she and she would be there, and she would uh, like she would uh, ask kids, you know, what their favorite show on Fox Kids was. Mine was Power Rangers. So. Yo, that was me too, man. That was me too. <clears throat> I was in love. I was in love with Kimberly. Mm-hmm. I I I was in love with her, and I wanted to be Jason. I wanted to be him so freaking bad. But yeah. You know, that, uh, or not yeah. Jason, but uh, Jason David Frank, Tommy. I wanted to be Tommy really bad. Me and my buddy next door actually made a game out of Power Rangers where we would like, we had like all the little fake weapons and stuff from it that actually yeah. combined together into the big gun. And then we had like the Zoids or the, the whatever they call them. Uh, Zoids. Zords. Zords uh, as like toys and stuff. And uh, we would draw like chalk on the driveway, um, like of different like monsters and stuff from the show. And so then one person would like blindfold themselves and walk up the driveway until they stepped on one by accident. Like, you know, and like that, per- that monster would jump out and then they would be a power ranger and have to fight that monster. And it was ridiculous. Dude, that's nice. So like the other person would like be like, you know, try to do like, you know, harder stuff like to deal with if they were a harder monster to defeat. Like Zordon was one of them, or not Zordon, but uh, Lord Zed was yeah. one of them at one point. Yeah. Stuff I, like that. I remember, I remember it was funny. I remember me and my buddy Andrew, uh, we played, we had this place in the woods <clears throat> where we went and there were these, there were these huge rocks that were back there that you could climb up on and go back into and everything. And they had these little hiding places and all that. I remember one, at one point we were doing a Power Ranger fight and it was me and him versus, uh, it was me and him versus, uh, I, I think it was Goldar at one time. And, uh, I remember... I actually got like a, I actually got Saba. I had Saba, you know, the White Rangers uh, weapon. I I had him, and I was like going, and then uh, I had a. This was, this was. I remember before Saba, I wanted a Green Power Ranger uh, flute dagger. You know, his dagger I thought was really cool. Um, we couldn't afford one, but you know what my dad did because I love the show so much. He cut me one out of wood. Oh wow! He cut me one out of wood and he spray painted it green. He brought it home to me, and I thought it was the greatest thing ever. I was just like, "Oh my gosh, <laughs> I got my own dagger!" Yeah, I remember that. And then the the reprisal theme was. There's been a meme about that lately. Oh really? Oh god! And then of course on Fox Kids. The, it, does this remind you of anything? Banana na 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 na. Yeah. Banana na 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 na. Banana na 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 na. That's the X Men theme, isn't it? Yep. 
Couldn't sleep last night. I kept thinking about how the Green Ranger had a dagger that was a flute that sounded like a synthesizer that's trying to sound like a trumpet, and he blew into it with his helmet on. Yeah. (laughs) Hey, hey, that's just how it goes. That's just how life goes, man. All right, well, the Nostalgia Critic did a video on Fox Kids. Um, I guess uh, let's just dive into this and see what happens. Are you ready? Yep. All right. I'm ready. Let's do it. All right, here we go. Three, two, one, go. Wow. Sorry about that, guys. Just had to had to do an edit or two. Cheerios, too. Yep, that was a thing in the nineties. <laughs> Goosebumps. My favorite Goosebumps story, actually. Haunted Mask. I remember Goosebumps. This is loud as fuck, by the way. Say again? I said this is loud as fuck. Yes, it is. It's Saturday morning! Oh, Critic, we didn't get much sleep. Too excited for your bowl of Lucky Frosted Cocoa Tricks? It's part of a complete breakfast. From where? Dairy Queen's dumpster? Now don't be like that. I poured you each a bowl of that last Saturday in preparation for this. You mean this has been out for a week? It helps open up the flavors. Oh. Uh. <sighs> and I'm vegetarian. I'm pretty sure that used to be a lie. Huh? Sit yourself. Okay, Critic, can you explain why we're up at dick o'clock in the morning? <laughs> I forgot it. you're a humble aim. You're not aware of the ritual of Saturday morning. You see, Saturday morning used to be a special time for kids. We'd often have friends sleep over the night before and then wake up to the majesty of television's Saturday morning cartoons. Mm. Each one filled with brain-rotting material coaxing us to buy teeth-rotting material. Unfortunately, TV did its job too well and the following generation said, Let's just have this shit raise our kids 24-7. Thus, every second of every goddamn day was Saturday morning cartoons. And they got rid of them years later. Society sucks. Okay, we're not 10 years old. We had Saturday morning cartoons, too. We're just wondering why we're here this Saturday morning. Oh, well, that's because we're paying homage to one of the best in Saturday morning awesomeness, Fox Kids! In 1990, the then still young Fox Network aired its Saturday morning lineup of shows called Fox Kids. It included bumpers, PSAs, catchy songs, and of course, some of the best kids shows to ever air on TV. Eventually branching out to Monday through Friday as well, Fox Kids lasted 12 years, an unbelievable run when you consider its counterpart, The Disney Afternoon, lasted only 7 years. While half of these shows can still be viewed today, some of them have sadly never gotten a DVD release or were never aired again. So keep in mind, we're not going to look at every single show that aired on Fox Kids because, like I said, this is 12 years of material. We're just going to look at the most unique, inspired, and memorable parts of the greatest Saturday morning lineup there was. So, with our sugar-coated poison in hand... Younger kids wanting to watch what the older kids are watching. Hey, guys! Can we watch the shows, too? And an overprotective parental who thinks if it's not Sesame Street, it's bad for them. I'm sorry, kids, but you're too young to see this kind of stuff. I'm older than half of them over there! Shoo, shoo. I hate you! Because I don't have a real father! Kids, are you enjoying Saturday morning? Yes, Sad. That's good. I'm gonna. That's actually Doug's dad. So on the stove, just for you. Do we have a stove? Ah! Well, figure out how that happened later. This is Fox Kids. Oh yeah, Bobby. Tiny Toons and Dynamo, Fuck. 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 Fuck.
I do not remember this song. I remember it. Yep. Let's start with one of their earliest staples, Bobby's World. Oh, I've yep. seen this. It's like if Calvin and Hobbes... I forgot about this until just now. Hey, it's a lot more than that. Sounds pretty accurate. Yeah, hey, okay, it's pretty accurate. Bobby's World was based off of the little boy voice that comedian Howie, Howie Mandel, Mandel yep. was popular stand-up. were a strange time where crude comedians got kid-friendly shows, he was given one of his own. Just look at how awkward he is in the live-action openings. Hi everyone, I'm Howie. Welcome to Bobby's World. And you know what I really hate? Of course you don't, because you don't know me. You know what I hate? Germs! God, I hate germs! Well, certainly yeah. being that a younger demographic than the other Fox Kids shows, Bobby's World showcased the imagination of a little boy misinterpreting what adults say. Either that, or he swallowed all of his mother's NyQuil. Either way, neat. <laughs> The characters included how he has his father with the Jew fro rat tail haircut. Common? A cast of Fargo as his mother. And then you need to go upstairs and wash your face and hands before we leave for Aunt Ruth's, don't you know? His older brother representing the 90s trying to kill the 80s, and his older sister representing the 80s refusing to die. Along with Uncle Ted to give his obligatory fart joke. How come you can make bubbles without putting your face in the water? Tell you what, Pablo, let's just keep that our little secret, okay? <laughs> Bobby had children's fantasies often based on movies a kid his age wouldn't see yet. Looks like somebody read the kid-friendly version of Die Hard. <laughs> so was it any good? It was... hypnotizingly unoffensive. It's for little kids, so it's simple, but imaginative. It even had possibly the first Saturday morning character to get pregnant, and we actually see her progression throughout the season. Little touches That's true. like that make it stand out just enough. And I guess kids thought the same thing, because it was surprisingly one of Fox's longest-running shows. Add a catchy as hell theme song, and you have a decent start to the Fox Kids lineup. Bobby's cool, World. But how about some more violent stuff? Well, you're in luck, because this network also had Tom and Jerry. Yes! Kids. I oh. that yes. Talking about the Tom and Jerry. Yeah, this was not. I do remember yeah, this another thing. Another strange trend in kids' shows for yeah. a while was just making famous characters younger. Because if there's anything better than seeing someone brutally dismembered and maimed, it's... Seeing it happen to them as children? <laughs> Finally somebody gets it! No? What? I have issues. <laughs> you don't say. It's pretty much the same Jesus. thing as the regular Tom and Jerry cartoons, except it was done with kids. So the slapstick wasn't nearly as violent, and therefore not nearly as funny. Granted, it had other characters too, like Spike and I his know, son man. Tyke, Droopy and his son Triple. In fact, how are Tom and there Jerry is an episode of Always Sunny where Mac and Charlie beat the shit out of these punk kids. It's Goldeneye. fucking hilarious. Also, how did minions exist with dinosaurs millions of no, years ago? No, it's true. It is true. I... This is a road you don't want to go down. <laughs> okay. Ever bring it up again? Ever. Okay. Much like Bobby's World, this was obviously meant for smaller children, so it was tamer and more gentle than previous versions. So not good. Yeah. But for little kids, it gets the job done, I guess. I mean, it is better than other outings Tom and Jerry have had recently. Uh, Never forget those faces. It lasted a few seasons, though, so it obviously had its fans. It's not the cat and mouse team we remember, but it's not obnoxious either. It wasn't harmful enough to be Tom and Jerry, but it was harmless enough to be a decent distraction for little kids. Tom and Jerry kids! But let's get to something more grisly and adult. Peter Pan and the Pirates. Let me explain. This was actually a badass show. This was an awesome, awesome we show. Know the classic book, play, Disney film, and childhood scarring. But few adaptations oh. of Peter Pan huh. ever captured the darker and surprisingly more adult take of the original J.M. Barry story than this one. I know that sounds strange, but this was actually a really great show. It was! Ideas that took concepts from the original book and pushed them even further. For example, Peter steals the pirate's shadows, and what happens? They walk upside down because they've lost their anchor to the ground. 
That's so creatively strange, but it weirdly <laughs> makes sense. Yep. In another episode, Peter is gone for too long and forgets about everybody because he's distracted by Wendy's future daughter in the real world, who he brings back to Neverland to meet her future mother despite them being roughly the same age. Bye, Uncle Michael. Uncle John. Why are you sad? Because I learned today that I shall have to leave Neverland sometime. But I'm happy, because when I do, I'm going to have a daughter as wonderful as you. It's super surreal, but it's also surprisingly adult. Yeah. It's kind of like the ending of Return to Neverland, where young Peter meets older Wendy. That's a lot of people's Damn, favorite part I remember of that. that. This that show is mostly comprised of scenes like that. The characters all have fleshed out personalities, with Peter always hungry for mischief, the Lost Boys and Pirates all having distinct character traits, and in my opinion, the best Captain Hook ever portrayed Tim Curry, the baby. only actor who could perfectly portray him. Literally, the first perfect thought that comes into your head Tim is Curry. Tim, Tim Curry. Curry. You've got Woo! Tim Curry! If I must die, I will encounter darkness as a bride and hug it in my arms. Yes! It's the first Captain Hook that has <laughs> mm! mention to it. Yes, he's an angry screamer and a scoundrel, but he prides himself on being a gentleman and a sophisticate. One minute he's ready to stab your heart, but the next he might let you go if you make him laugh with a reading of Shakespeare. Oh, damn God. They give you death by inches. No, no Shakespeare gives thanks that you aren't here to witness this atrocity. He was an egotist, but still valued his bizarre ethics. It made him both funny and intimidating at the exact same time. Mm -hmm. And nowhere is the series complexity shown best than in its series finale, where Peter decides he does want to grow up and he starts to wither <laughs> away into an old man, unaware that he's actually taking Neverland with him. So you could argue Hook was being portrayed even before Hook was doing it. It's surprisingly mm -hmm. intense and unbelievably well done. It lasted for only one season, but it resulted in a ton of episodes and had a pretty good life in It was reasons. like 40 episodes, Finally, I think. though, there is no DVD release of it. If you're able to find it on YouTube or anywhere else, definitely watch as many of them as you can. It's yes. It's a cannonball of imagination waiting for you. Peter Pan and the Pirates. That's all fine and good, but what about the poor people who demand a series about demonic fruit? Malcolm. I had no segue into To the corner <laughs> with you. <laughs> so, um, because we apparently demanded it, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes was given its own cartoon series. Based on the B-movie comedies, it did have some of the original characters, like Igor, Terra, that parachute guy, and even John Astin reprising his role as the mad scientist who made the evil vegetables. Fruit. It's 2018. Nobody uses that term anymore. <laughs> the strangeness wow. of the films Good one. It didn't have much more beyond that. The plot is similar to the movies in that a mad scientist wants to take over the world vegetable. with the tomatoes Fruit. and his failed experiments, Terra and FT, and tomato war veteran Wilbur tries to stop it. He gets help from the main lead, a boy who was not in the movies, and you can clearly see why. He's pretty bland and forgettable, and the animation doesn't do him or any of the other characters any favors. You know you're supposed to stay away from salt! If someone sees you... What is up with this girl? Is the binary code on her neck being hacked? Must blackmail George Clooney with Return of the Killer Tomatoes footage. Yo! Zucchini! Look at this scene. She has to lean over to talk to FT, but look how she does it. It's Igor, Dr. Gangrel. What the hell? Is this part of the joke or is it just poorly animated? The whole show is kind of like this, leaving you with no idea what's intentional and what isn't. Even the dialogue, you can't figure out what they're aware of and what they're not. Being a luscious, ripe tomato can be hard on a girl. Whatever you're thinking, erase it from your heads. I had a line about her being saucy, but never mind. I guess on a level of bizarre awkwardness, I can see this entertaining a few, but for many kids, the most memorable part of the show is the theme song. But goddamn, that's a catchy theme song. But not all the Fox Kids shows started off on Fox Kids. Ah, ah, yes. A charming story about a dead man who befriends an underage girl he was going to marry. Finally, somebody who gets it. Do I have to worry about Malcolm? Might. Beetlejuice had only the slightest connection to the movie, which was surprisingly welcomed as it allowed for a lot of wild and inventive designs. Granted, in the movie, everyone looks the way they do because they died that way. Here, I don't know how the shit they were supposed to die to look like this. Tim Burton himself helped design the show, and it certainly shows in all the strange people and creatures. Yep. It had little in terms of plot, but it had a lot in terms of visual and gross-out humor. 
At the time, especially when there wasn't much in terms of dark or macabre cartoons, <laughs> this one gave us a small but still memorable taste of the enjoyably morbid. Yep. It was a waste of time, but it was a fun waste of time. <laughs> That's probably my favorite theme song, too. But I know too. what you're thinking. If Beetlejuice got a cartoon, have that as a ringtone on, on my phone. Because no one was thinking that. Just for that, the plant raps. No! Little Shop is based on the musical interpretation about the man eating plants. I don't think I ever Except saw this Seymour one. Is now a little boy. The plant rap I remember it, but I, I only watched like one or two episodes of it. This looks more like the bumpers you see before they go to commercial. You don't get those bumpers enough credit. The focus of the show is the plant is trying to get Seymour to win the girl and defeat the bully while also running a plant shop that's constantly infested with bad musical numbers. My business is a bust. Business. What a joke. God, I wish this had the original cinematic ending. Why is he even shocked the plant is talking? The flowers act as backup <laughs> singers all the time. I'm not even sure the plant is talking. His lips move so rarely. The is for commuter training. Many parts are edible. I guess I can give credit that for a show that had a budget of monkey feces, the backgrounds are at least creatively simple. I mean, I'm sure the Leia artist had two minutes to color these on Mario Paint, but there is at least a little structure in between <laughs> the poorly animated sections. Oh god, he's having a stroke. Nope, that's eh, just a bad show. The writing doesn't make any sense either. The girl in the show is obsessed with a refrigerator. I'm going to repeat that. The girl in the show is obsessed with a refrigerator, and they never explain why. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I think it's really cool. For women. Hey, my love of refrigerators has nothing to do with my gender. Now, if you'll excuse me. Jesus, Tam. Tamara, what the? You're so good. Little Shop of Horrors was ahead of its time. Apparently. Like I said, this has little redeeming value, but I'm sorry, I have to reference a Little Shop of Horror cartoon show in the 90s where the plant raps. I know you think it's a crime it exists, but it's an even bigger crime to act like it doesn't exist. The show lasted only 13 episodes before it was yanked, and you can see why this fertilizer didn't get far. Word, Little Shop! I'm noticing a pattern of characters that most likely wouldn't make a good show. Not making a good show? Were there any existing characters that allowed for clever writing or intelligent dialogue? <laughs> yep. Yes, really. Warner Brothers gave the task of turning one of their most profitable Looney Tunes, the Tasmanian Devil, into a hit show. How do you do that, though, when his dialogue is mostly... <laughs> Well, they ingeniously make everyone else very well spoken. Yes. Even to the point of it being ridiculously overwritten. Accumulate a portfolio of stock with a net yield of no less than 36% per annum. There's nothing like a paper in a recliner craft chair for a man after a tough day of doing whatever it is I do for a living. To rekindle the lost flame that connects our souls with the true harmony of the universe. Now I am in a quandary. Technology's the culprit here. Science be blamed. Because of this, not only did Tasmania have a distinct sense of humor, but its writing was surprisingly ahead of its time, along with other shows like Duckman and Simpsons. Yes, really. Based in the land down under, where Wacko Warner sings the theme song, Welcome to Atlantis Way, under, down under. Taz lives with his talkative family, interacting with his talkative friends, and partaking in the conversations as little as possible. Much like the other Warner Brothers shows, there's a lot of fourth wall breaking, a lot of slapstick, and like I said, surprisingly a lot of talking. Again, from a show where the main character talks like this. <laughs> Though not talked about by many, Tasmania still had an impressive four-year run. It had good animation, good timing, and actors who had to talk a surprising mouthful for a show about a Tasmanian devil. Ferociously intense, not that he's likely to make much progress given his choice of methodology. He's got a house to show, a career seminar to attend, some charity work to do, and a dinner party to prepare. So my schedule's pretty much open. It's so strange this would be both as funny and as wordy as it is. But maybe that's part of the bigger joke in general, that the most dialogue-focused slapstick children's show was around this guy. Shall we pause to consider this irony? Maybe later. Sadly, there's only a few DVD releases of this show. Mm -hmm. It honestly deserves a lot more. 
The episodes you can find, though, are a ton of laughs and had a lot more work put into them than they probably deserved. To put it short, Tasmania is a heck of a spin. <laughs> Nothing, I'm, I'm watching uh, Tiny Tones here on Nickelodeon. Very innocent, wholesome quality. Wheels of the bus go so Tiny Tones is actually the first exposure to Freddy Krueger I had because there was a character that was, was like that Freddy Krueger in that show. Oh. I remember that. But what did that have to do with it? Because that scene always bothered me. It wasn't on Nickelodeon, it was on Fox Kids. And they didn't do stuff like sing the wheels of the bus go round and round. It had good writing, it was a good show! Shame on you, Seinfeld! Shame on you! Oh my god, okay. Doug, calm Sorry, down, man. I never had an outlet to talk about that clip. It always bothered me. It always bothered the cast. So many things wrong about that clip. It was a good, decent show. It just has been building Critic. up for a while. It's... Critic, it's not your fault. I know. It's not your fault. Malcolm. It's not your fault. Don't do this to me, man. It's not your fault. Don't do this to me, man. Not you. Not you, man. It's not your fault. Stop it. Not you. It's not your fault. Tattoos. We're tiny, we're toony, we're all a little loony. So having a very loony. successful run in syndication, Fox <laughs> Kids bought Tiny Toons and ran it from its third season on. It was one of the few shows based on the younger version of popular characters that branched out not only to be successful and funny, but also obtained its own identity over time. Characters like Elmira, Montana Max, and Furball were all very different from their counterparts Elmer, Yosemite Sam, and Sylvester. The nice thing is, while in syndication, there was definitely a lean towards being more kid-friendly. But when it went to Fox, they broke out more of the classic Looney Tunes humor. With celebrity jokes, in-jokes, satire, a buster that sounded eerily close to the Crypt Keeper. Tunes from the Crypt. <laughs> <laughs> it played well. So well that one of the most popular characters, Plucky Duck, was given his own show that same year. Yeah, so what was that? It's... complicated. You see, the first episode of the spin-off was actually hilarious. They're acknowledging he's getting his own show, but he abandons it to try and beat Batman in Tim Burton's next movie. It's amazing <laughs> how funny it is. The violence, the satire, the celebrity in-jokes. Tim! I should be Catwoman! You know it! Look at me! Roar! Roar! It had a ton God. of viewers rolling on the floor with laughter. It was so good. That sounds great. What happened? That was the only new episode. They weirdly just started showing clips from other Tiny Toons episodes where Plucky Duck was the focus. So what was supposed to be the Plucky Duck show just became the best of Plucky Duck. A clip show. Maybe this was filler for a show they didn't make in time. Maybe they only animated the pilot but pulled the plug like what they did with the Elmira show. Whatever they did, it faded quickly, resulting in only 13 episodes. Regardless, we still got a pretty funny first episode and a ton of great <coughs> material from the original Tiny Toons giving it a memorable and hilarious run. And now our song is done. <laughs> God. Not every I'm glad they're bringing it back. I know what you mean. They're bringing it back? Yep. I didn't know that. Homeboy, isn't it? Tam. Really? That masterful work will have its day. But I was talking about Eek the Cat. <laughs> Eek! In a world filled with Ren and Stimpy knockoffs, Eek the Cat was arguably one of There's the There's a couple of shows that I'm trying to remember like if they were shows, on this. It had a similar style, but still its own hilarious identity. The opening sums it up perfectly. He has a dream about helping someone, wakes up to reality, and everything tries to kill him. That's basically the plot of every episode. The world is trying to punish him for all the good deeds he does. But nevertheless, Eek is always kind and optimistic, always helping people no matter what's thrown at him. It never hurts to help. And indeed, a lot of strange things are thrown at him. It's a world where snacks can blow up in your head. The cereal and pops in your head, not in your hand. Cuddly bears are greeted with machine guns. <laughs> and Ross Perot was commander in chief. Back when that was the craziest person who could be president. There was a mean-spirited creativity to it that was held together by just how gentle and helping Eek is. Hey, no swimming for an hour after you eat. You don't want to get a cramp. No matter what, he always wanted to help, even if it meant getting pummeled. Well, at least I remember that little shark dog. I remember it too. Bad aliens will never do such bad things again, and someone will be here to get me soon. I'm, I'm just sure of it. Hell, the biggest curse word he ever used was kumbaya. Kumbaya, wait. 
Granted, as the show went on, they seemed to run out of ideas, so they started putting him in several movie parodies. They were fine, I guess, but it was a little <laughs> odd, even for this show. To make things even stranger, the time slot was suddenly being shared with another show. Suddenly it was called Eek Stravaganza, and half the running time was dedicated to Thunder Lizards, a series about dinosaurs who were trying to wipe out a new species called Man. At the moment, there's only two of them, and they're constantly screwing up trying to evolve. I invented this. I call it a washing machine. I figured it out. The fire washes things, okay? Watch. These guys are like the prototype for SpongeBob and Squidward, except the sexual tension might be a little greater with them. Why does the hurry stop? The show was pretty funny, but not as good as Eek. Nobody minded too much that the shows were cut in half, as we still got our daily dose of Strange, and the show had a good run of five seasons. Sadly again, though, there's no DVD release, hence the watermark. With the rise of even more surreal humor and internet culture, this really should be more available to the public. It was mean, violent, cruel, relentless, yet funny enough, had a good heart at the center of it. Eek definitely needs to make a comeback, and hopefully somebody out there can make it happen in the future. But there's stuff for dog lovers too. Jim Henson's Dog City, for example, lasted for three seasons. Based on Henson's short film from another TV series, the show opened in the puppet world where an animator created a private eye show about a detective named Ace Hart. It then jumps into animation as Ace constantly battles the gangster Bugsy Vile with the help of Chief Rosie O'Gravy and Paper Pup named Eddie. I forgot about this too. I remember it. In this, I remember there was a annoying, character called the Watchdog. Wild, there's so many of them. You're kind of floored so many could exist. I did some sniffing around, trying to get a leg up in the case. Have more bread, beef biscuits. Bernard St. Bernard. St. Paul! Not much bark, but what about our bite? Station WFIDO. Some thought he was one table scrap short of a full doggy bag. I'm annoyingly intrigued. <laughs> like many Jim Henson projects, there's a charm in how kid-friendly it wants to be. For example, the animator hates violence, so guns are usually replaced with rolled-up newspapers. And when guns do eventually make their way in, he switches it out for a senseless showdown. It's kind of adorable. Diving into unknown waters is senseless, but is it as senseless as running with scissors? I think not. The strange thing is Fox would do another dog detective show called Droopy Master Detective. What was up with this concept? They had the same obsession Disney Afternoon had over ducks. Did they just think this would be the next big thing? Did they even watch this show? While Droopy was canned pretty quickly, Dog City had a pretty decent run. So I guess if you're a dog detective person, I'm a cat detective person myself, Dog <laughs> City is cute enough to give a viewing. <laughs> You know, Critic, I gotta admit, these shows are fine, but they're not really mind-blowing. Yeah, where's the really cool stuff? Well, over the next three years, Fox Kids would have their highlights. They would give us the most incredible, awesome, badass shows any kid has ever seen at the time! <laughs> Dad! Stop lying in! <laughs> I'm just trying to help. You're embarrassing me in front of my friends! Go away! Okay. I love you, son. I didn't quite hear that. Love you too. I can't hear you. I love you too. Oh, <laughs> loves his dad. Get out of here, Dad! You ruined everything. <laughs> shut up! Shut up! Shut up! I'm supposed to be badass. I'm badass. Stop it! Stop it! All of you hate you. Seriously, stop! Stop! Seriously, seriously, stop! 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 Even though Fox Kids was growing, it still wasn't the dominant force in Saturday morning or kids shows. But year three is when all of that started to change. Fox Kids expanded from Saturday morning to weekday afternoons, which was a risky and expensive move. Mm -hmm. If they wanted kids to constantly be watching, they needed some kick-ass shows to keep them hooked. Thankfully, they had little gems like this, and this, yep. and this. Yes. Now I've talked to death about these shows in the past, so I'll do my best to talk about something different about the impact that they had. First Batman the Animated Series. After two wonderfully dark Batman movies, an animated version of The Dark Knight not only won both kids and adults over, but it served as a game changer for Batman in general. 
a lot of writers went on to several other Batman canon projects. Several characters and backstories created for the show made their way to the official Batman lore. Yep. And even to this day, when most people read Batman comics, the voices that pop in their heads are always Kevin Conroy as Batman and Mark and Hamill, Hamill as the Joker. Joker. Yeah. It's hard to read them without making that connection. Wherever you go, I'll be right behind you. That's all, folks. Unlike other kid <laughs> shows at the time, Batman took years to develop resulting in a unique style not often seen in many animated series. The backgrounds always started off on black paper to keep the dark environment of the show consistent. Yep. The characters and buildings had an art deco style as opposed to a pulp comic style like all the other shows. And the atmosphere in general was more adult, allowing for quieter moments, slower pacing, and more realistic acting. There was no other animated action series that looked like this at the time. And now, every animated action series is trying to look like this. It still looks fucking fantastic. Even years later. Funny yeah. And too dark and gritty. It seemed like it incorporated everything. It felt true to the comic roots, worked in the adult side of the movies, had a good laugh at the campiness of the situations, and yet somehow also felt like its own unique vision. It's just as good today as it was when it first premiered, and no other Batman show has ever topped it. Think about it. After all these years and all the other incarnations that have come out, no other show has done Batman as well. It's just as clear today as it was years ago why this was a huge game changer. But Warner Brothers was breaking new ground with another game changer! Uh. What? I was just talking about Animaniacs. Uh. Oh, I see. You guys think I talked about it too much, huh? If Animaniacs was a prostitute, you'd have paid off five of her house loans. Yeah, but <laughs> damn, cat or something? No. But through the magic of wishful delusions, now they have. Uh. Fine, fine, I'll keep it short. Seen as the follow-up to Tiny Toons, Animaniacs was a variety show that stepped up its game. Every episode had a plethora of great songs, memorable characters, hilarious animation, but most important of all, brilliant writing. Mm -hmm. It was truly the closest we ever came to experience the fresh comedy of the original Looney Tunes. They had the great comebacks, the violent slapstick, the imaginative take on the world we all wanted to experience. This must have been similar to when people saw a Bugs Bunny cartoon for the first time on the big screen. There was just an excitement that you were going to see something clever, funny, and filled with so much energy they felt alive. Along with Batman and Tiny Toons, it was one of the few shows that had an entire orchestra providing the music. And speaking of which, the brilliant songs are still being used by kids today to pass countless school exams. In fact, they even keep updating the songs to coincide with the constantly changing world. In fact, these songs even went on tour with songwriter Randy Regel and actor Rob Paulson singing their infectious earworms. <laughs> They're still that popular. It seems the show was so popular that it's even being rebooted. In 2020, these characters are coming back to give their take on modern day insanity. Hell yeah. All right. I, the shot I, I think it was Animaniacs Internet, and not Tiny trends, Toons. Politics. Yeah. It's crazy exciting to see where this can go. Will it be as good as the original? I guess only time will tell. But one thing's for sure, we'll always have these timeless, classic, hilarious characters to look back on. That's actually more exciting to me than Tiny Toons. I fucking love Animaniacs as well. Yeah. I would definitely now watch the new one. No, I've barely talked about X Men. Oh. oh, will you two knock it off? You knock it off. You've talked about this show so many times. There's nothing left to cover. Oh yeah? I thought I can find something new to talk about. Prove it. Fine. <laughs> Apparently, it was the passion project of the head of Fox Kids. Margaret Loesch ironically used to be the head of Marvel Television, producing hit after hit, except well, that's probably a synthesizer, but still. Funny enough, the Marvel characters never rocks caught hard on enough to be on guitar. Every huh? attempt seemed to so I know that's probably a synthesizer, but it rocks hard enough to be on guitar. It, yeah. Wait, she's not drawn in the X-Men, is she? She's just a kid! That's almost too ironic. She went from <laughs> studio to studio trying to get X-Men made, but they all said the same thing. It was too adult, and nobody would watch it. Margaret then went on oh, to be the president crap. of Fox Kids and cared so passionately about getting X-Men a TV series that she put her job on the line. They knew if this was going to be good, a lot of money had to be thrown at it, so she took the gamble but picked the right producers, writers, and actors to make it work. The only downside is there was not much time to make it work. In fact, the tone and animation were so campy and off-key in the first season that they only had two episodes for the big October premiere, that being the two-part pilot. What the hell do you do when you need months and months to rework your show? You present the first two episodes as a preview. Yeah, it pissed off the advertisers and cost a fortune, but Margaret and showrunner Eric Leewald knew they had to get this right if they were going to have a hit. 
The preview thankfully went over incredibly well, and left people wanting more. So, after a redo of the show with better animation and more adult atmosphere, it finally premiered with no other new shows being put on. That's right, because they waited until spring, it got more attention because everything else was reruns. As you'd imagine, the numbers were through the roof. Yeah. X-Men was suddenly Fox's biggest hit. It mm -hmm. represented more than cool heroes with powers. It grasped the prejudice and torture character arcs, as well as the all-around badass nature people love from the comics. After being told no over and over from several studios and even ignoring advice from Stan Lee to make it more kid-friendly, the creators stuck to their guns and turned in a huge payday. Much like the X-Men who had to fight for human dignity, so did the creators who wanted to see their timeless characters done right. X-Men would go on for five seasons, one of Marvel's longest running series. It launched them into the mainstream more than before, leading to several reboot series, comic spin-offs, and of course a beautifully inconsistent movie franchise. This was a gamble that paid off all the way to the X-Bank. <laughs> So, with Epic that theme song. Although I will say this, I'm upset Doug didn't talk about the Japanese intro. Have you seen the Japanese intro? Yeah, Expert? you showed me before. Yeah. It's freaking balls to the wall amazing. It's better than that one. But that's that's a whole other thing. So I guess, uh, yeah. Back to it. Those three gigantic hits, Fox Kids was moving on to their next big... Um, egg. aren't you forgetting another hit show? Don't think so. Yeah, yeah. Still only a little over like a halfway through this. Even today. Yeah. No, 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 there's no other hit shows at that time. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Fine. There might have been another teeny incy wincy hit of a show called Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Go, go, Power Rangers! It's no <laughs> secret I never got into this show, even as a kid. It was just. The so fuck dumb. why? The Bullshit, time Batman dude. and X-Men were on, we had about that double date we talked about? Yeah. <laughs> so dumb. But okay, let's talk about it a bit. Because on the one hand, it is a brilliant marketing strategy. Five teenagers with, with attitude. Are yes. summoned by job of the fuzzy mouth to stop a space witch named Rita for her crimes of bad lip syncing. They first do a martial arts fight against a monster of the week, and then they grow in size and use giant robots in a fight against Los Angeles Japanese mountains. So, yeah, the setup was pretty obvious. Shoot American actors for dirt cheap, and then cut the Japanese stock footage from another hit show in Japan. Power Rangers, of course, turned into a huge hit. Which meant as long as they were still making shows in Japan... Oh god, they'll never stop! They never could keep will. making shows here. Power Rangers was not only the longest-running series on Fox Kids, but it surpassed it. Even after Fox Kids shut down, the show still continues to have an impressively long-lasting life. It had many spin-offs, mm -hmm. storylines, reunions, callbacks, and tons of B-movie monsters to fight. On the one hand, I really wanted to like this show because, hey, martial arts, giant robots, killer monsters, that can be some fun shit. But... I guess you finally flipped over me. <sighs> so dumb! It was clearly past my time and not for me, but that doesn't mean they didn't tap into something that excited a shit ton of kids. And some very disturbed adults years later. Power Damn right. Rangers, whether you like it or not, was, and still is, an impressive spectacle. Yeah, I never get, got into all, like, the but series after the original, but the original Mighty Morphin, Power, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers was my shit back in the day. Well, for me, I stayed with it all the way up until the actors changed in, uh, in Turbo. Uh, when the actors changed in Turbo, uh, I, I sort of lost interest in the series. The, the last one I saw was a movie, and I can't remember the name of it, but... Well, they've only made two... The theaters. Well, back in the day, they made two Power Rangers movies. They made, of course, the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie, which had them going to another planet to get the ninja powers of, uh, of the animals, which I, which I was okay with as a kid, but then... They did Turbo, a Power Rangers movie, where it was all cars. Yeah, I don't think I saw Turbo. I think I just saw the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers movie. Yeah, I saw Turbo, <laughs> and I, it was at that point I started to become disenfranchised with it, because even though I did like uh, the people who were still involved, I mean, the only actor on the show that I liked was Jason David Frank, the guy who played Tommy. See, I've... Like basically my entire life, even still today, anytime they have like one specific series that runs for a while, right? And I like all those characters and stuff, but then they try to do a new series within the same universe with entirely different characters and shit. I usually just don't get into the second one. 
It happened with Digimon. It happened with Power Rangers. Even today, yeah. it happened with the second season of Love Live. <laughs> so that's the last time I can remember that happening. That, well, that's fair. I mean, it's not for everybody. I mean, the the separate stories and all that. Me, personally, I like I said, after after they changed the actors up in Turbo, I stopped watching. Every now and again, I'd like see an episode. I remember Power Rangers in Space and Power Rangers Lost Galaxy. And then there was one, I believe, Dino Thunder, where Tommy actually came back for a while, hmm. which was weird. I was just like, wouldn't he be like a super old man by now or by then? Or I don't know. Never I don't mind. Know. I, I gave up trying to. There could them. easily be time travel shit with all of that. Who knows? Yeah, I don't know. I really don't know. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get back into this. So here we go. Three, two, one. Wouldn't be the '90s unless we forcibly had to teach you shit. Where is Carmen San Diego. Thankfully, some shows were better at it than others. Like where on earth is Carmen San Diego? I remember a nope. different theme song. This was a different kind of Carmen San Diego. One that was on a kid's computer game that tried to educate you. That's exactly what Carmen San Diego is. Okay, maybe not that different. The on-screen player always had to pick two characters to go after Carmen, and he always picked the sister and brother duo Ivy and Zach. Oh God, tell me he didn't ship them? It's a kid who's always at his computer. So probably. Probably. Hello, Ew. player. Ew. Thanks for picking me. Yeah, that sounds weird. There's a freaky-ass chief who seemed to be a mix between Max Headroom and the genie. Ivy, 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 you simply must learn to accessorize! Regrettably so. And the duo had to chase Carmen around the world to get back the famous monuments that they'll inevitably homeschool us about. Okay, listen up, gum shoes. You'll be heading to Holland. It's the home of wooden shoes, tulips, and the world famous windmills. On the one hand, this doesn't work as well as the game show because the investment. The game shows where I think no you heard the theme song from. Further. Here. Steal your soul in South Korea. Yeah, the, that one. Is where like, in the world yep, that is one. Carmen San Diego? Yep. Here, the show just kind of comes to a halt to teach you something. He used bold colors and violent brushstrokes, often slashing at the canvas as he painted. On the other hand, though, it did have a story to each one, and Carmen herself was just as stylish and cool a villain as you would want her to be. In fact, a lot of the time, she would leave the clues on purpose because she loved the thrill of the chase. At first, I thought this was kind of lame, but then the more I thought about it, how clumsy is Carmen in the other versions to always leave something behind? Here, she's at least owning up to her stupidity. The show lasted a good while with four seasons, and even though the education stuff did feel a little forced, it was still cool seeing the Queen of Thieves do what she does, and I guess help us get a little smarter watching it too. It was decent enough for what it was. Hey kids, what's more awkward than movie Spider-Man? Other movie Spider-Man? And? Cartoon Spider-Man? And? Other cartoon Spider-Man? Yes! <laughs> Yeah, there was some awkward stuff in this. Writing the tales of X-Men, heck, even doing a crossover with them later. Spider-Man tried capturing the same complex characters and ideas their other hit Marvel show had. Did they? No. It's complicated. No. no. <laughs> Spider-Man was great if you wanted the experience of the comic, but it didn't really segue into an emotional TV series. It might have been surprisingly overambitious, as every second it's either explaining what's going on, explaining the emotions, explaining the inner monologue. It could never take a break. Then we have to assemble those of us who are left and go protect the site of the Doomsday Complex. I feel like I'm witnessing a part of this country's history. After seeing the beacon, we always assemble here. I had to crack open a map to remember where this building was. How have you been, Madeline? Oh my god, breathe! You guys are going faster than the dialogue in the social network. Yeah. The CG City wasn't a bad idea at the time, but now it just sticks out like a sore thumb. Yeah. In other instances, the CG background matches the look of the painted background. This just looks like he's swinging into a screensaver. But those are just little details. Maybe it could still work if the writing was sharp. Yeah, anyway, this lizard thing is probably just an urban myth. Wait a minute. Looks like I was myth taken. Oh. <laughs> but again, to its credit, it did take a lot from the comics, trying to cram in as much as you can in a kid's show. I just think it did it too damn much. It wasn't Power Rangers silly, but it wasn't X-Men serious either. It was something in between. But it seemed to be enough as this Marvel show lasted five seasons, so I guess it must have made a big connection with a lot of fans. And granted, there were some really cool things to see, like Tony J as the Kingpin, Mark Hamill as the Hobgoblin, yeah. not Topher Grace as Venom. Yeah. I think we thought this would be the greatest Marvel team up we would ever see on any screen. Power of Lightning Strike again! Um, power of Web 
shooters get real sticky. Sure. These days it sounds a little corny. Looking back, it's not as bad as I remember, but his pacing is still way too fast for us to absorb every adventure. Yeah. It's got his fans, though, and I can see why. It was a huge hit, and anything that makes this a little less awkward must be doing something right. <laughs> Spider-Man. But for my money, the best superheroes always shouted, Oh, can I say it? I've always wanted to say it. Go ahead. <clears throat> Fork! It was one word. It was one goddamn word with five letters. You couldn't even say five letters! Look, this is nice. <laughs> While there were comedic takes on superheroes in the past, none were quite as funny or odd as The Tick. Yeah. Again, leaning its writing towards the adults rather than kids, The Tick told the story of a nigh-invulnerable, absent-minded superhero and his voice of reason sidekick, Arthur. You can't fight evil with a macaroni, macaroni duck! duck! I'll be the judge, judge of that. The <laughs> 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 way he just fucking walks through the door frame and takes some piece <laughs> off in the shape of his head is fucking fantastic. <laughs> 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 God. Definitely didn't lose any of its funny. Absolutely not. If anything, it's more referential now than it ever has been. <laughs> yep. It's aged wonderfully. I love it. God. I'll be the so judge of that. <laughs> most people agree this is the one that was the most faithful to the source. It did what many superhero parodies do, adding a big slice of reality to our comic book fantasy. But the biggest punch it lampooned is just how many damn superheroes there are. Particularly now with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the Tick addressed what would happen if so many of these side characters and spin-offs really did exist in the same universe. This is all the heroes you could find? Well, it's such short notice. These people have lives too, you know. Though sometimes <laughs> the animation could be a little choppy and the timing a hint off, the Tick still had original writing with very enthusiastic characters. But what really pursued us? Where were we really trapped? Come on, Arthur! Get meta with me! Tick himself is infectiously <laughs> positive. He just loves being the hero, but he never came across as egotistical. He really believes his corny speeches and one-liners, thinking they inspire people just as much as they inspire him. What pursued us were our own obsessions. I'm good. You're evil. I'm a woman. You're a man. What does it all mean? Nothing. He never felt cynical or mean-spirited. He doesn't think much about what he's saying, but rather the way he's saying it. To a point where even silverware can serve as a battle cry. Boom! It had a modest run of three seasons and continued to run in syndication, only increasing its cult following. Though there'd be many variations on this crazy idea, by far the one who came the closest in strangeness and comedy was the one on Fox Kids. Mm -hmm. That's cool, but can I have a show based on a book series where the scariest part was the cover? No. Oh. But you can have a show that's less scary than Are You Afraid of the Dark? Goosebumps. I still liked a couple of episodes. I did though. too. Some of them were actually Especially the good. Haunted Mask. Oh yeah, the Haunted Mask was terrifying. It was wild, imaginative, and not the least bit scary. Hey! You know I'm right. You all know I'm right! When I was younger, I was always pissed off that all the scary shows I watched were never scary. Goosebumps, Are You Afraid of the Dark, even Tales from the Dude, Crypt, I never found frightening. You have to admit. As I got older, I realized that's oh, not on. really what they were about. The intent wasn't to scare you, the intent was to have the haunted fun. Haunted Mask was creepy as a kid. It was. Setup. It was. One of these episodes is about a killer sponge, for God's sake. The hokey acting and over the top writing only add to the B movie quality that honestly kind of gets better every time I see it. That doesn't mean they weren't trying, it just means it should be enjoyed on a different level than you might expect. It's like getting angry if a Scooby-Doo episode isn't scary. It's just <laughs> not what you're supposed to be looking for. Every show had a new monster or a new scenario that would tie into the character's persona or fear, similar to the Twilight Zone. Except, you know, laughably stupid. It took me a while to warm up to this series, but now watching it with the intent of having a good time, that's exactly what I get out of it. A good time. It's one of those kooky kid shows I, weirdly enough, like even more as an adult than I do as a kid. Just for entirely different reasons. On a man, there it is. Also, like, I'd, I'd have to see it again to be sure, but I'm pretty sure Carly Beth's Sam actress in the Haunted Mask episode was, like, really fucking good. 
Like, oh, I thought to, like, so the too. Rest of the, where she couldn't, uh, where she couldn't stuff. get the mask off, she was just like, like it was like believable that she was freaking the fuck out and having like a breakdown and stuff. And, yeah. Like, when she was like upset over the duck costume and everything, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like. She, Ripped it to pieces and all that. Yeah, that was a really good episode. And, like, that was my favorite story anyways from Goosebumps. Like, yeah, I always it, thought that was the best. Well, well honestly, that ties into a uh, that ties into a, a natural fear that sometimes as a kid we have is that sometimes we'll, like, we'll get stuck in a situation that we have no way of getting out of. Yeah. And we are often put in places where no one believes us. Mm. Even, when, even if we explain ourselves, like, sometimes they just don't believe you. And I and I think that's what that that one story ties into, and I think it is probably one of the more terrifying ones out of the of this. And I remember I liked the mm-hmm. uh, um, a night in terror tower or whatever as well. Ah, uh, yeah, I remember that. It was one. pretty good with the executioner guy that was chasing them around. <laughs> oh god! All right, well, let's get back to it. And Please Monster though, Blood. Fox kids began Monster Blood's episode wasn't was good, but the book was. Jeez, oh, how long did they last after that? Just a mere six years. That's stupid long. I know, but here's the thing. Warner Brothers was starting their own network with their own kids programming called Kids WB. Mm-hmm. And when they started up, guess what they took with them? Animaniacs, Looney Tunes, and Batman. They even did spin-off shows like Superman, Pinky and the Brain, and their own little Japanese import that was dirt cheap to make and would run for years and years. Still Back runs to this day, Animaniacs actually. The Animaniacs episode on Kids WB was a parody of Fox's biggest show, Power Rangers. Hey, what's wrong with your mouth? It's all fuzzy. Fox would still do well, but this was a big bite for them. And many of the upcoming shows did well, but not nearly as well as before. Another Spielberg show called Toonsylvania tried capturing a darker tone on the Animaniacs formula, but sadly the writing wasn't on point and it didn't last very long. I talked in great detail about Sam and Max in another mm-hmm. episode. It was creative, but a little too unfocused, earning only one season. And then of course there's this. That's like summing up the Titanic in one sentence. I need a full episode to go into what's wrong with that. Yeah, mm-hmm. good call. After that, Fox Kids went the same route Kids WB went, importing more and more Japanese shows after seeing not only how easier they are to put out, but also how cheap they are to do. Yep. And sadly, I stopped watching after that. If we were going to go into this in more detail, we would need people that actually grew up watching this. <coughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 Hey kids, remember this incredible writing? That's a lot of fish. They made a show out of it. Oh God! Shh. Yep, that's true. They did Godzilla. <laughs> and they made a TV series. The series I did watch some of that. Of I did too. Godzilla I watched movie. like two episodes. Some actors from the film lending their voices to reprise their roles, including Bart Simpson. Shh. Thankfully, Matthew Broderick wasn't one of them, but his character... Oh, what? Nick... Nick Totopoulos. Nico Totopoulos. 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 It's Greek, haha. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh, did return. The only surviving offspring of the Godzilla that attacked New York in the movie imprinted onto Nick as its parent, and thus they used him as a government-sponsored Pokemon to fight other giant monsters. That's so stupid, I'm surprised it wasn't in the 98 film. So am I. Hmm. The series was received pretty well by fans of Godzilla, but honestly, following the 98 film, there was nowhere to go but up. We did get some great kaiju fights in the show, though, so I guess I can look past I mean, Godzilla's dick that's crazy a chin. badass Godzilla design. It is. And then there's Power Rangers in space and Lost Galaxy. Uh. Yeah. Power Rangers in space wrapped up the show's initial run and was supposed to be the series finale. As we know, that didn't happen. Much to our regret. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't like it back here. What on the surface seemed like Star Trek Light actually became one of the most popular and well-received seasons in the show's history. They went much further with character development than they did in most of the previous seasons. Yep, I watched the beginning of this and then I quit watching the Power Rangers after the beginning of this. That's why I quit. brainwashed as the Power Rangers' main enemy and even more multidimensional villains. There's plenty more to talk about with this season, which finished the Zordon era and ended up saving the franchise. But some of you may just know it for their crossover with the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Cowabunga, I guess. Hey, we have a deal. No next mutation unless he's fully being tortured. It's okay, just the mention <laughs> of the idea hurts me. 
The next season, Power Rangers Lost Galaxy kept the outer space theme but began a new phase in the PR legacy. Starting here, every season introduced a new cast with new powers, zords, etc. And that became the status quo for the series moving forward. Saban's big plan to get this phase going? Sword in the Stone in Space. Woo? Actually, this season was pretty good. I enjoyed quite a bit. But I know what you're thinking. Those shows needed a lot more Ryan Gosling as young Hercules. It's actually amazing how much we weren't thinking that. Well, Fox Kids was. <laughs> That's right. We did get that for a little while. I Kevin forgot Zorro about show that. Starring a young Ryan Gosling. I always speculated this was just another Goosebumps episode he was in. It is scary enough. What else do you need to know about this show? Well, I think this clip says it all. What is a, a performance that you've given? Something that you're in, insanely proud of? My work on Young Hercules. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Leather pants, just fighting imaginary monsters. They weren't really there, but I was acting like they were there. a Goosebumps episode. <laughs> we also can't forget about Beast Wars. Beast Wars. One of yes. favorite childhood shows. It traded in cool cars, trucks, and jets for animals like rats and ants. The toys were badass. Ants uh, and dinosaurs and, and gorillas. This was my generation's Transformers show, and I mm -hmm. absolutely loved it. Beast Wars, along with Reboot, was among the first all-CG animated series. The early computerized look doesn't hold up all that well, but for the time, it was revolutionary and set the show apart from most other things on TV. The stories were great, the characters were great, it was just a really solid animated series. That being said, You stay away from this, Michael Bay! You hear me? Don't you dare defile Rat Trap Tiger Trotter Optimus Rhino! For more on this series, you can check out my top five best episodes, right here on the channel. If my face isn't on it, I don't watch it. Like I haven't heard that before. <laughs> Beast Machines Transformers was the less popular sequel series to Beast Wars. It took place almost immediately after and was dark, sobering, and kind of depressing at times. It you was, know, yeah. The change in tone and design wasn't something anyone was asking for, but it did end all the stories that started in Beast Wars and has gained a small, dedicated following over the years. Blah, blah, blah. Get to the more hardcore stuff. Oh, you mean like Frank Miller? <laughs> yeah. yeah! Wait, what? what? Yeah, there was a show based on a Frank Miller comic. Watch the stars coming at you, a hero. Hell yeah. Big Guy and Rusty the Boy Robot was a show based on a short comic written by Oh, Frank I do remember this. Too much crossover this. between the show and the comic, with the show actually being more fleshed out than the comic. Is Samuel L. Jackson in a Nazi uniform? No. No. That's a good start. Rusty is the most advanced robot ever made, with a complicated AI and ability to feel emotions. He was meant to be the successor to Big Guy, an advanced robot that protects Earth. However, Rusty's emotional circuits and AI are young, and he therefore acts like a child. Rusty needs to learn how to be the protector of Earth. Big Guy is recommissioned so he can teach Rusty. Big Guy and Rusty was one of the more complex and mature shows in the Year 10 lineup. It was pretty interesting and unique. Although it was never my favorite show, I do remember being engaged by it and wanting to see what happened next. <laughs> All right. Well, it's good to know not everything was a Japanese import. And then there was Digimon. Yeah, okay. Digimon. Digital monsters, Digimon, Digimon are the champions. When Pokemon became yes. a smash hit, Fox Kids tried to capitalize on that market and trend by introducing the world of Digimon. Seven kids at a summer camp are transported to a digital world, creatively called the Digi World. There, they discover they are the Digidescent, who must help save the digital and real world with the help of their partner, Digital Monsters, or Digimon. They are also given Digi devices, which transport them between the real and digital worlds and can help their Digimon Digivolve into other forms. Say Digi again! I dare you! I double dare you! Digi. Well, now I'm mad! Don't care. <laughs> the show was actually a lot of fun. Although it never reached the fever pitch of Pokemon, it was received well by audiences. Mm -hmm. Although there was fan demand that the anime be shown in its entirety, as the Fox Kids version was edited and changed to fit a more humorous tone than yeah. the Disney show. And who could ever forget that theme song? Digimon, digital monsters, Digimon are the champions. You know, I just got that damn song out of my head, and you put it right back in there. <laughs> oh, I know one that'll get. I, won't, I know one song that'll get it out of your head, Doug. DuckTales! A oh, woo! Uh, I know. I thought you were still humming. DuckTales! A oh, woo! <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know that was gonna happen! <laughs> I didn't know! <laughs> oh, oh god, it hurt. His pistol whipped the shit out of him. Pistol, no, just pistol. 
like just gun butted him to the face, dude. Jesus. That was awesome. <laughs> Oh yeah, Monster, Monster Rancher. Mochi. Uh, I forgot about this. Swayzo. Video game before being made into an anime that Fox Kids picked up. In the game, you use. I didn't see many of these, but I definitely saw some, and I thought they were cool. Golem. In the show, a boy named Genki receives a disc to use while playing. The disc ends up transporting him to a different world where the monsters are real and created by scanning stone discs in temples. Like Digimon, Monster Rancher was edited to make it more suitable for audiences, removing more dramatic elements from the series. I remember loving the show as a kid, but honestly, it was a bit bland and basically never <coughs> glorified commercial. Excuse me. So, an anime. Oh, Tamara. Christ, I hit a nerve. <laughs> <laughs> well deserved. Give Spider-Man another go with Spider-Man Unlimited, a loose sequel to the 94 series while having a strange and somewhat confusing plot that sends Spider-Man to a duplicate world on the far side of the sun called Counter-Earth. Normally, this would be like a parallel dimension or something, but apparently that's not exactly what Unlimited was going for. Instead, we got a really weird futuristic planet for Spider-Man to fight Venom and Carnage on while freeing humans from oppression. Wow, this is making his deal with the devil almost sound credible. Due to legal issues, this series couldn't draw from any of the decades of source material that came before it or even use the standard Spider-Man suit for most of its run. There have been some awesome designs for alternate spider suits made over the years, but a web cape? Unique, to say the least. The opening theme sounds like it's trying to be Batman Beyond, but comes off like it's goofy clubbing cousin. Like clubbing a seal, I think you mean. <laughs> I get that Spider-Man the Animated Series is an insanely tough act to follow, but Spider-Man Unlimited was a mess from the beginning, both behind and on the screen. I don't think I ever watched this one. Best I didn't, I like didn't remember it. And then there's Angela Anaconda. My name is Angela. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. That was on Nickelodeon. Yep. Yeah. Did any of us actually watch this show? No. No. I can see why. Yeah. By year 12, Fox I saw it coming on and I was just like, and pulled gotta go do something else now. To only Saturday mornings. By then, the writing must have been on the wall because the following year, Fox Kids stopped airing programs and never returned. Though many of these shows would exist in reruns, and there's more than enough kid shows everywhere now, that magic collection of the right talent for the right age group at the right time never seemed as prominent. Every Saturday morning built in anticipation like no other. Every visit home from school revved up excitement every kid could feel. For a pretty awesome time in our childhoods, we had a cool clubhouse that lived in our TV. And they told us great jokes, classic stories, the latest comics, and even taught us a thing or two. Mm -hmm. It was everything you thought of when you heard the word Saturday morning. It was a perfect experience so much of us were so happy to have. And we couldn't be more thankful to the awesome people who gave us some absolutely wonderful Saturday mornings on Fox Kids. Yeah. Speaking of which, we should probably start getting ready for bed. What? Oh yeah, I guess we have been watching well over 12 hours of shows. So what do we do now? Well, Protocol says we should be playing video games past our bedtime. Laugh and scream at basically nothing. And have deep philosophical talks while trying to go to sleep. Sounds good. Oh my god, duck season is the best! Shoot the dog! Shoot the dog! Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was never in that. Malcolm? Hmm? Do you believe in God? <laughs> believe? Or see? You see God? Well, yeah. I was thinking about that. And it had me thinking. What if Bowser's the good guy? Wow. You know? And Mario is really the bad guy? Okay, exactly. okay, okay, okay. That's a bad Game Theorist episode. I suggest not watching it. No. no. That's just not true. That's a dirty lie. Well, if Mario's the bad guy, <laughs> then Luigi is Satan. Oh. I'm wait. totally lost. How do we go from God to Bowser? I missed that. Video games are our God. Our own. Okay. It's my religion, actually. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So, like, video games equal God? It's all different, you know. 
denominations. Yeah, right, different right, right. sects. Like, Tamara believes in the denomination of um, PlayStation, but, like, Walter and I are Nintendoites, so, yeah. like, it can be I, awkward sometimes. I have a PlayStation, like, don't, don't mm -hmm. tell Nintendo, but, like, I have a PlayStation. Because, like, sometimes you just get to explore things, man. Yeah, yeah. you gotta do stuff well, you know? while you're young, you know what I mean? I think I'm an atheist because I have a Dreamcast. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you know what? I started with the Dreamcast, man. It's fine. Yeah. Everything's gonna be okay. It's I okay. don't know, man. I don't think my mom's gonna let me sleep over here anymore. <laughs> Damn. Okay. I don't remember ever having deep philosophical arguments uh, that went off on that many tangents. Although, <clears throat> it was actually my first. I uh, it was actually there was this one time when I was um, camping out in Boy Scouts that I came across my friend Damien who uh, when I was laying when I was when we were in the tent and we were having one of those conversations I actually found out that his parents and him were atheists and as a kid I didn't know or understand what the hell that was and when I found that out I was just like I asked my dad I said dad what's what's an atheist and my dad told me he's like it's a person who doesn't believe in God. And I, and I just I, I was like how though. And I'm just like and my dad just explained to me he said son it's just people come to different conclusions in life. Some people believe in God. Some people don't believe in God. Some people believe in a different God. The number one thing that I want you to take from this is that. Do you like Damien? Is he a good friend? I'm like, yeah, Damien's a good friend. He's like, then honestly, truthfully, that's all that matters. Damien's a good friend to you, and it's not on you to make him feel uncomfortable, or vice versa. If he ever demeans you for believing in what you believe in, then you speak up about it. But, you know, don't don't ag him about what he does or doesn't believe. You know, just 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 be honest with him. Be you know, be a good friend with, be a good friend to him. Your dad was definitely a nicer dad than mine. Well, my, <laughs> my dad, parents would have probably been like, "Wait, who said they were an atheist?" Oh, well, you're not hanging out with them anymore. <clears throat> well, my dad told me he's just like, "Don't." He's like, "If you ever have a crisis of faith, you know, come talk to me or come talk to your mom, or uh, or hell, or we can call up DJ because DJ was my youth pastor and actually." Yeah, you know, he's that pastor that I told you, you know, his favorite comic book character was Hellboy. Yeah. And honestly, he was more upset instead of being, you know, the whole pious, you know, oh, we're we believe in God, therefore we are greater. No, instead, he actually took us outside. We actually got to like sit in the grass and like and be amongst nature and actually he would teach us about the wonders of of nature and the wonders of God and all this and all that and it was awesome. It's like my two youth leaders that I had that I really liked a lot that this freaking prude ass family came to our church at one point <clears throat> and came to the youth group and their kids told their parents that like we actually got to do fun things during youth group and stuff and like got to do like extra activities in terms of like learning things. And so they told the uh, pastor or whatever that like some lies and stuff about them and got them basically fired. Like from their positions, and like I was like very salty and stopped going to youth group after that. It's it's unfortunate that people are like that sometimes, dude. Mm. It really is. I mean, because as much as I want to pretend and say, "Oh yeah, I," you know, I you know I you know, I've had a great life. I have had a good life. I've had a, I've had a really good life. I've met some really interesting people. I've met some really cool people. You are you're included in that list, by the way. Well, thank you. And um. I've encountered some people who believe the same things that I do and are absolute total pieces of crap and that I wouldn't piss on if they were on fire. Yeah. And there are people who I don't agree with on certain things who are absolute and total pieces of garbage that, honestly, I'd rather burn than recycle. So, it's just... One of those things is like throughout life, you're always going to encounter people who agree with you and disagree. That's like in this Doug talking shit about uh, Power Rangers yeah. in certain regards. Look, I know Doug's not going to like the exact same things that I do. I mean, I loved Power Rangers as a kid, 
I think it's just a generation. It's a it's a different time thing. I think Doug must be a little older than us. Doug is thirty eight. Last I've, time I looked. Yeah, and I feel like the uh, other two that he brought in are like more like us. And, like, They're more along the lines the same of our times age, that yeah. we did. Because uh, it, it was obviously like Doug stopped watching shortly before we did, and like we still watched for a little bit longer. Because I definitely recognized like everything they showed pretty much, except mm-hmm. for like minus like one or two things on that. Like, uh, there was a couple of things that I feel like they actually didn't mention that were on Fox Kids, but I might be wrong. I'm sure they covered all of it. I'm probably just thinking that we were on something else, I guess. Maybe. I, there's what, what network was SWAT Cats on? I think that was uh, that was Hanna-Barbera. That was Cartoon Network. Okay. Da, 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 da. That has a fucking epic intro. Oh, yeah, If you've never dude. seen SWAT Cats, go watch the intro. Yeah, the that intro is to that is, is balls to the wall awesome. Yeah. Because... You know, of course, you had T Bone and Razor. You had the the cat, you know the you know the cat jet, and you had the uh, just so much awesome in that. I think damn that show, show might be the reason I like fucking like fighter jets and planes. It Maybe was, it was just cool as shit. Maybe it was a cool concept uh, back in the day. Dude, I I'd love to go back and watch some of these shows and see if they see if they still hold up. Yeah, I'd like to just go back and be like, all every right. once in a while, I've checked on a couple old shows that I wanted to see if they were still as good. The one that disappointed me the most that I checked out that I was like, man, this is just not good anymore. Was all real monsters? Ah, real monsters. Yeah, to me, I used it, to love it when I was well, a kid, and then I watched it again, and I was like, Ugh. well, to me, it <sighs> Rugrats still kind of to an extent holds up though. Well, so to me, I think it's because of the humor that, or I think it's the adults in the background. We can more understand what they're talking about whereas kids we were a lot like the Rugrats and we didn't understand a lot of the dialogue going on that adults were speaking yeah and I think that's uh, same thing with Animaniacs Animaniacs still holds up amazingly well because well, there's like adult jokes that go over your head as a kid in Animaniacs well, and not only that but there's jokes that a lot of people say shouldn't be in there and I'm just yeah. like what the hell are you like talking about like that one joke with Dot and Michael Jackson oh no it was a Prince Prince yeah yeah it was like no, no, no. Fingerprints. Uh, I, no, don't I, so. I, I don't think so. <laughs> Throws them out the window. Yeah, then there was also the, uh, then there was also the one where uh, it was, um, it was pretty much three in a row. Uh, I was like, it was like, it's like, Yakko, do you know how to conjugate? Me? I've never kissed a girl. <laughs> and the, then the second was, no, 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 let me conjugate with you. And he looks at the camera and goes, "Good night, everybody." <laughs> and then the third one was her reaching into her blouse and pulling out a marker to to like uh, write on the board. And he's like, "Ooh, what else you got in there?" Yeah. <laughs> it's like three of those in a row, and I'm just like, "Holy crap!" Like, as a kid, I as a kid, I thought it was funny because I was completely unaware what the hell they were talking about. But then, as an adult, which I'm just was like, the tall one and which was the little one? Uh, there was Yakko, who was the tall one with okay, the slack. So Wacko, is Wacko the was yeah. the one in the blue shirt and the red cap, yeah. who spoke in a Liverpool accent. Next time, I'm gonna play the piano with my butt. And then there was Dot, who was the sister. It's t- actually I can do that. The entire- one joke that for some reason I've always remembered, because I had to ask my mom, I guess, to, uh, because I actually didn't know what the word meant at the time. Um, was uh, Wacko? What is the meaning of procrastination? I'll tell you tomorrow. <laughs> I'll tell you tomorrow. <laughs> and I was actually like, "What does procrastination mean?" And my mom had to explain it to me, and I was like, "Oh, I get it. Ah, uh, yeah, I get the joke." Now. You see, as a kid, we laugh at it because it's 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 presented in a funny way, <clears throat> but as an adult, we laugh at it even more. Yeah. That fucking tick. <laughs> you can't fight crime with a macaroni duck. I'll be the judge of that. I'll be the judge of that. <laughs> <laughs> I love the tick. Just the so fact much. that it's just that little bit of the door for me. It's like almost like they animated it and realized that he was gonna run into it. They're like, well, just have him like fucking take it off with the top of his head, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's too good man that's too fucking good yeah god I miss I kind of want to watch that show again now I miss being a kid yeah me I'm, too dude. I miss being a kid and, and watching this stuff for the first time and just getting exposed to that and getting uh, and just seeing it so has Nostalgia Critic done Toonami by the way he has not I hope he, he does at some point my, well he he said his thing about Toonami is he was too old for that oh man no 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 but but 
He's not against someone else taking the reins on it. As a matter of fact, Chris Stuckman, uh, another great online reviewer, if you know, those of you out there who don't know who he is, you need to check him out. Um, yeah, Chris Stuckman actually did a Toonami one. He actually, he actually got, he actually went to a convention and met Steve Bloom and got to talk with him about his time as being Tom yeah. on Toonami. It's like that's the one thing I didn't get to talk to Steve about when I met him because it was just you know I didn't want to hold up everybody behind. Yeah, me. yeah, yeah, yeah. But I wanted to be like, yeah, dude. Also, like you know, I watched Toonami like all the time. Tom was like you know awesome. I always got so hyped. Well, Tom was like the ultimate it's VJ. Like, hey there, Toonami faithful. He was also like the ultimate video jockey because yeah. like he would just come on and just be like, "Hope you're ready for this," because I am. Yeah. And then he'd hit the it. Stuff and he would hit. run and stuff like I don't know. He's oh. like. I I don't know. He was just cool as fuck. <laughs> yeah, I remember the midnight run. He's like, lock the door. He's like, lock the door and draw the shades. It's the midnight run. I was like, I can directly attribute one of my hobbies right now to Toonami and Tom and you know, Gundam building. Yep, building Gundams. Yep, I figured. So came home from fucking school that one day and saw Dragon Ball Z and I was like, what is this? Well, you know, and then the next thing that comes on is Gundam Wing and I'm like, oh, that's cool as fuck. Giant frightening robots. Yeah. Well, for me, Toonami, actually, uh, there was one... I caught DBZ at a pretty good spot, too, because I missed, like, the first couple of episodes. But I think the first episode of Dragon Ball Z that I actually caught was um, the episode where they actually killed Raditz. Mm -hmm. And so, like, you know, it was getting good, like, as I started watching it. Yeah, this right here... Like, I didn't miss this too intro much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is a little bit of a teaser, a little bit of a hint... Of some of the stuff that that we got you know, as what kids. My life was when I came home from school. Me, I'd rush home, turn on the TV, and then I'd hear this. Yeah. It makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I am the prince of all Saiyans once again. Yes! <laughs> That's the shit I'm talking about, man. Yep. When we were kids, that was it. That was all you needed. It also had the hype. best intro music on that out of any of the iterations of Dragon Ball Z as well. That's true. Rock the Dragon. Yeah. Dun, dun. It's hype as fuck. I had just like gotten into that kind of music like right before that, so when I heard that theme song, I was just like, "What is this?" Yeah. Uh, oh, let me see if they got the Gundam Wing one on here yeah. too. It's uh, a Gundam. There's a Gundam down yeah, that's here. That's actually in the intro from Toonami. So I think that's why it's a Gundam's <laughs> channel name is it's a Gundam. Oh, there it is. There it is. Yes. Oh, uh, oh, uh, this is this is it. <laughs> Enemy attack! Yeah! Every one of us! Mission accepted. <laughs> yes! <laughs> Badass as fuck. God, dude! My childhood! My friggin' childhood. I would go through high school again to go back and like just be that age and get to watch this all on TV again. Yeah, me for me it was uh, for me it was late middle school. I think it was like sixth, seventh, eighth grade. Yeah. And then uh, and then high school was when Toonami was really at its peak, and when that's when actually I think that's when Dragon Ball Z actually had. The, I don't know if you remember this, but early on, whenever Dragon Ball Z would uh, do its run, it would stop. It would stop whenever Goku would, got to Namek. Yeah, it would have to start over. Yeah. And then eventually they started showing more and more of it each time. And like they finished Namek, started over again, then got back, and then they finally did like the Cell the saga. Android saga. Yeah. yeah. And like the Android saga was where like me and my friends were like talking about it like every day. They were like, "Oh, I can't wait to see what happens." Yeah. Holy dude. shit! He's, he's, he absorbed eighteen last night. Like, yeah. The, and do you, how long, how strong do you think he is now? He was my like, Holy God. Fuck. Yeah. And also, oh. And, of course, the first time me and my buddy Andrew tuned in, whenever Perfect Cell came into being, and then, uh... <laughs> uh there it is. 
<laughs> the final, uh, his final flash when he did the, uh, yeah. <laughs> God, it put chills on the back of my neck because you saw him powering it up for like half an episode. Yeah. And then he was just like, stand right there and don't blink. Yep. And then he did, and then he did the final flash. There was another one though. Uh, I think like. Uh, the music whenever Goku is like powering up for like a second time I think after he's already Super Saiyan and it was like the most epic fucking music like and I can't was it when he killed Frieza I don't think so I think it was after Frieza I think it was during the Cell Saga wait oh I know the one you're talking about it's when he powers up in front of Trunks it's the one that goes like da 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 I know the I know that one Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be on this now for a little... Here, here, here. I know, I know the one you're talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be on this one for a while. Yeah. So this... this You see what this... this You see what this episode of Nostalgia Critic did? It did this. It's got us going back and looking at our childhood and, re, and recalling it and recollecting it. This is the beauty of these kinds of videos. Thank you very much for suggesting this, everybody. And I want to thank the Nostalgia Critic. Doug, if you ever do see this, thank you so much for making this video... This was awesome. Thank you so much. So, anyway, uh, next time, uh, well, if you want to see the original video, link's in the description down below. So, until next time, signing off, I'm Nate. I'm Nick. And we'll see you in the next one. Peace out.